Hello everyone, welcome to this class. We are doing DIT 2211 Software Engineering. I'm Madam Linda Sawe from the School of Computing and Informatics, Department of Information Technology. Today we are doing our lesson one, which we will basically be introducing ourselves to terms that are related to software engineering. And uh, the objective of this topic is to introduce software engineering and to explain its importance, to set out the answers to, to key questions about software engineering, to introduce ethical and professional issues, and to explain why they are of concern to software engineers. So let's just embark on our introduction and we'll define a number of terms. The first term I want us to define is what is a software. Now a software is basically a set of pro computer programs and its associated documentation such as requirements, which is what the software should do for us, design models and user manuals. Now software products may be developed for a particular customer or may be developed for a general market. Now, software products may be of two kinds. We have generic kind of software and bespoke or custom kind of software. Now, what is the difference between these two types of softwares? Generic software is software that is developed for the general market, while bespoke is customized for a single customer according to their needs or their specification. Something to note here about software is we may develop a new software from a new program that is from scratch, or you may configure a generic software system that is software that is already in the market, or you may reuse an existing software. Now, what are the advantages of a tailor-made, which we've called a bespoke kind of software? One is that the personal needs of the customer are met, and then the ideas of the user or the customer are incorporated meaning it will be what the customer actually wants. What are the advantages of the generic ones? Generic ones, have, we've said, are the software that are generated or created for the general market. One is that they are relatively cheap compared to the bespoke, which is the custom kind of software. And then it, uh, the updates of this software are readily available. You know updates are very important for any software to keep the software up to date. And then more error free compared to the bespoke kind of software. And last but not least is that generic softwares are readily available. The second term I want us to define is what is software engineering, which is the name of our course. Now, software engineering is an engineering discipline, as we can see the engineering name, that is concerned with aspects of software production. Now, software engineers adopt a systematic and an organized approach to their work and to use appropriate tools and techniques depending on the problem they wish to solve or the development constraints. That is what is limiting them as they do the development and the resources that are available. Resources are very important in terms of time, money, such kind of resources. So software engineers adopt a systematic way to come up with software depending on these limitations that we have listed there. Now let's compare software engineering to other disciplines. The first discipline I want us to compare it to is software, uh, computer science. Now computer science and software engineering are easily confused but there is a clear distinction between the two. Computer science is basically concerned with theory and fundamental concepts that we use as software engineers. But software engineering, on the other hand, is concerned with the practicalities of delivering and developing useful software. That's one very clear distinction between the two. Software, computer science in itself has insufficient uh, fundamental concepts that may not only be used for software engineering. So it's important to note that we use the theories and fundamental concepts that computer science provides to do software engineering or to develop software. We will also compare it to system engineering. Now, system engineering is the umbrella of software engineering, hardware aspect of uh, computer-based systems, and even process engineering. So, system engineering is an umbrella of all these engineering aspects of the computer-based systems. And uh, 
system engineers are usually involved in the process of software engineering since they provide us with system specification, architectural design, integration, and deployment. So the other term I want us to define is what is a software process. Now, a software process is a set of activities whose goal is the development or evolution of software. It states the following activities. We have specification, which is a description of what the system should do and its development constraints. Then we have development, which is the actual production of the software system. Then we have validation, which involves checking that the software you are developing is actually what the customer wants. Then we have evolution, which is the changing of software due to changing customer needs. You know software changes. Softwares are dynamic. So it's good to remember that evolution is a very important aspect in the process of the software process. Now, another term we need to understand in regard to software engineering is what is a software process model. We say that software process is basically a description of the activities that go to the process of developing software. Now, we have a model that we have to follow. This is a simplified representation of a software process presented from a specific perspective. Now, software engineers can have uh, these three perspectives that we have listed. We can look at it from the point of workflow, and workflow basically looks at the sequence of activities in that particular software process. We can also look at data flow perspective, which looks at uh, what, uh, how is information flowing in that particular software process. And last but not least is role or action perspective, where we look at the software process according to who is doing what in that particular software. Then uh, the generic process models that we have are the waterfall model, iterative development model, and the component-based software engineering model. We will look at these models in details in our lesson two, but for now, just note that the generic, the common uh, software process models that we have are the waterfall model, the iterative development model, and component-based software engineering model. Now, uh, let's look at what costs do we incur during software engineering. Now, 60% of the costs go to development. Then 40% of the remaining goes to testing of the software. So it's important as a software engineer to know that out of your 100% budget, 60 goes to development and 40 goes to testing. Now, for custom software, evolution costs often exceed the development costs. It's just a good thing to know. Then costs will vary according to the type of system being developed. Then distribution of costs will depend on the development model you're using. We have stated the generic process models that are used, so that model will also determine what costs your software will go into. Then software costs often dominate computer system costs in general. Then software costs are more to maintain or cost more to maintain. Also, that is something very important to note. And last but not least is that software engineering is concerned with cost-effective software development. Now, uh, what are some of the software engineering methods that we have? The common software engineering methods that can be implemented or that can be used are model descriptions where you describe your models graphically to show what software is supposed to be produced. You have to have rules, which are constraints that are applied to the system models. You have recommendation, which is good advice on good design practice, and then we have process guidance, which is what activities to follow when you are doing software engineering. Now, uh, next is what is CASE. CASE here stands for Computer Aided Software Engineering. These are basically tools or software systems that are intended to provide automated support for software process activities. So these are basically the software or applications that help the software engineers to develop the software or during the software process activities. Now, case tools are divided into two, 
depending on what activities they support. We have uppercase and lowercase. Uppercase are basically tools that support the early process activities in the software process, like requirements gathering, design. Then we have lowercase, they support later activities like programming, debugging, and testing. Then what are attributes or the attributes of a good software? You would want to develop a software that will be good, that will be acceptable to your customer. Now, what are some of the characteristics of this good software? One is that a good software should be maintainable, meaning it should be easy to evolve to meet changing needs. Customers keep changing their needs. They keep specifying a new or an added requirement into the system. So a good software should be maintainable. It should be dependable. We are saying dependability here, meaning software must be trustworthy. Your customer must trust the software that you're giving them. Then we have efficiency. A good software must not make wasteful use of resources. It should not hog your resource. You install this software, it makes your computer run very slow. It's filling up your memory. Now, uh, that's not an efficient kind of software. It should run seamlessly like you've had that software always. It should not hog your resources or even slow down your computer system. Then a good software must be acceptable. Your customer must accept this software because it is what he actually ordered for. It, it, it can be a very embarrassing situation where you develop a software and then the customer refuses that software. Those are just but a few attributes of a good software that you should consider as a software engineer. Now, how can you achieve that acceptability, maintainability? You need to ensure that you involve users during software production so that you don't surprise your customer just the last day and appear with a software, they will be like, this is not what I asked for. Then you can use prototypes. Nowadays we have standards for developing prototypes. You don't have to design a software from scratch. You can reuse software that is already there so that you just uh, edit that software to be what your customer actually wants. Then you need to train your users so that they know how to use the system then uh, you need to prepare user manuals or help manuals for your customers so that they can always refer to it in case they are stuck with the system. Now, what are, the, what are some of the challenges that software engineers face? We have one called heterogeneity. This is whereby software engineers have the challenge of developing techniques for building software that can cope with the changing technology or the changing platforms or execution environments. You notice that in the discipline of software engineering, technology keeps changing. Software engineers have the challenge of developing software that can last through this changing technology. Delivery, quicker ways of delivering or faster ways of delivering software is still not in the market really. So it's a major challenge for software engineers and then trust. People don't trust the software that software engineers produce or uh, the customers may feel that this software is not all that, it's not what I want, it's not very secure. They will have that fear of that particular software, so that is trust. Now, uh, software engineers are professionals and every professional has an ethical and a professional responsibility. Now, software engineering is not left behind. Software engineers have some of the uh, things that they are uh, considered they should be responsible for since they are professionals. Now, this uh, ethical uh, responsibility here is simply uh, the behavior of how software engineers or the behavior of software engineers in the market. And we have a number of items that every software engineer must put into consideration. One is confidentiality. Keep the confidentiality of your customer, keep the confidentiality of your clients, keep the confidentiality of your employer, whether or not you have signed a formal confidentiality agreement. Number two is competence. Do not misrepresent your competence level where you knowingly accept work that is not, or that is not possible within your skill. So it's good to accept work 
or take work that you know you will deliver. Leave work that you cannot deliver. Then ethical responsibility number three is intellectual property rights. Now, software property is intellectual kind of uh, property which you need to know what laws are there, what laws are in the government or in your nation or wherever you are about software or intellectual property so that you're not in trouble with the law. Things like patents, copyright, among other things you need to know. Then last but not least is computer misuse. Do not use this skill that you have to harm others. Maybe... Uh, do not use it technically to misuse other people's computers. Maybe you take out some component from the computer or maybe delete their files intentionally or even disseminate files in, or viruses in that particular computer. Now, what is the importance of software engineering? One is that most or all economies now in developed countries are dependent on software. People are... Uh, opening up to software products uh, or to software kind of applications in running the activities of their organizations. Number two is that uh, more and more systems are software controlled now. We don't do manual systems anymore. Most of the companies are moving towards computerized or software controlled kind of systems like airplane or aircraft uh, aircraft uh, software navigation and such like things. Then we have uh, software engineering is also concerned with theories, methods and tools for professional software development so that is very important and then expenditure on software represents a significant fraction in most of the developed countries. So they allocate some amount to software which is very important. Now we'll move on to the software process now in detail. We have already mentioned earlier that the software process is a structured set of activities required to develop a software system. It involves, we had mentioned earlier, specification is the first activity and specification is the process of establishing what services are required and the constraint, constraint on the system operation and development. It's also involved with requirements engineering process, which is the process of gathering requirements, which involves what? Feasibility study, requirements elicitation and analysis, requirements specification, and requirements validation. There's a small diagram here to represent the requirements engineering process. Feasibility study where you have to see and analyze the software you're trying to produce, whether it's viable, whether it's doable. You do an economic kind of feasibility. You do a schedule feasibility. You do a legal feasibility and so on. Then you set out to gather requirements and analyze these requirements of the software you're trying to produce. Then you will have system models developed from these requirements. Then you move on to specifying the requirements themselves and then validate the requirements and finally you should have a requirements document. Number two in the process of the software process is design. You have done specification, you move on to design. Design is the process of converting the system specification that we have developed earlier into an executable system. Now the main phases in design are two, as you can see here. We have software designing and then we have implementation. Now software designing involves designing a software structure that realizes the specification that you had already identified in step one. Then implementation is translating the structure into an executable program then uh, this you can do in a certain programming language of your choice. And then the activities of design and implementation are closely related and may be interleaved, meaning you can do them together. Now, what are some of the design process activities? We have defining the architecture of the system, architectural design. You have abstract specification where you define your data types to be used, the data structures to be used in that software. Then you have to design your interfaces. Remember, the interface is like uh, 
the, the, the platform where the user interacts with the software itself. You have to define a good interface for that case. Then we do component design. We have to def design each of the components in the system. Components here are the small parts of the system. Then we have data structure design. You define the data structures that are used in that software. Then algorithm design. You have to have the step-by-step -step procedure of every activity in that system. Now, there's a systematic uh, representation of the different design aspects we've talked about there. We have architectural, abstract specification, interface design, component design, data structure design, algorithm design, and so on. And e after each design, you have to have a specification document. That's why you see it's written system architecture that will be the output of architectural design the output for abstract specification here we have is the software specification interface design will have interface specification and so on so this is basically the design activities organized in the way they come and what comes out of each activity we move on to that uh, another point whereby also during design you usually have to document a set of graphical models like what object models you have to define the objects in your software you have to do a sequence model how are the activities sequencing which activity comes before what what activity comes after what and so on the transition model how are the activities transitioning from one activity to another then the structural model and the data flow model how is the data flowing in that particular software. Number three activity in the software process in detail a little bit is programming and debugging. Now, programming is the process of translating a design into a program and removing errors from that program. Now, debugging here is simply the removal of errors from the program. Programming here is the actual coding or actual writing of the programs. Now, programming is a personal activity. There is no generic programming process. So you have to do it, actually. Then programmers carry out some program testing to discover faults in the program and to remove these faults in the debugging process. Now, the debugging process is simply simple. You locate the error, design an error repair, which is a code to repair the error that you're getting, then repair the error, and then retest the program. You do it over, over and over again until the error is cleared in the program. Then we have verification and validation. This is the fourth process. Now, these two are very important activities, and they are intended to show that the system conforms to its specification. Remember, specification was the first step. And also to ensure that the system actually meets the requirement as per the customer description. Then uh, it also involves checking and reviewing the processes and s testing the system. Now, system testing involves executing the system with test cases, actual test cases, that are derived from the specification of the real data to be processed in the system. And testing will incorporate or will mean you do component testing, you do system testing and acceptance testing. Now, component testing is testing the individual components of the system. Then afterwards, the components are integrated to have the system. Then you do the system testing. And finally, you do acceptance testing to see that the system will be, t will be accepted or your software will be accepted. Move on. These are simply the points I've actually explained there. You test individual components in component or unit testing, integrate the components, do system testing, and then do acceptance testing, testing with customer data to check that the system meets the customer's needs. Then the last step in the software process is evolution, which is also referred to as maintenance. Now, software is flexible. We've said software is dynamic. It changes. Therefore, we need to factor in that we are designing a software that may change from time to time. This is what we are calling evolution. So software is designed to evolve and to change. So as a customer uses the software, they will tell you, add this for me, remove this, upgrade this, add this feature, and so on. That's what we are calling evolution. And as we do evolution, you need to define the system requirements. What are these new requirements that your customer wants? 
assess the existing system to see what is not in the system that the customer now wants. Then after that, you propose the system changes which is now the modification that we are supposed to make into the system, modify the system, and then you will have a new system at the end. So this is very important to note that software is bound to change, which we are calling evolution. Now let's look at the generic software models we talked about. We said that we have how many models, how many generic models? Three, the waterfall, the evolutionary development and component-based software engineering. We will look at them in detail. We are said, we've said that a software process model is simply an abstract representation of the process or the software process. So let's look at each of these models in details. We'll start with the waterfall model. Now, uh, there are many variants of the waterfall model, but uh, this is a common software process model that most of the customers use. It's in a waterfall-like, whereby an activity of the software process trickles down to another activity iteratively, whereby you finish one activity before you can start the other one. And it starts with requirement def definition, whereby you define the requirements of the system, then you move on, or to the requirements of the software, then you move on to system and software design, whereby you come, with de you come up with design models according to the requirements specified. You do implementation, which is the programming, and do unit testing. Unit testing is also referred to as component testing, as we had said earlier. Then afterwards, you do what we call integration and system testing. Integration here is combining the system components that you have identified or the unit components, and then now you do what we call uh, the overall system testing, and then you do operation and maintenance. You have to maintain your system, as we've said. Now, uh, these are the steps in the waterfall model. We have already said you have requirements analysis and definition. We have system and software design. We have implementation and unit testing. We have integration and system testing, and then operation and maintenance. Now, the main drawback of the waterfall model is that it's difficult to accommodate change after the process is underway. Now, as I've said, the processes are iterative like a waterfall. You finish one before you can go to the next one. Now, imagine if you have to make a change when you're in the fourth step. It means you have to roll back to the beginning. So that is the main drawback, and it's very important that you use this model once you are sure of what requirements this system should have so that you move. Otherwise, it may be a challenge. And then uh, it's noted here that one phase has to be completed before moving on to the next phase. Now, what are some of the challenges of the waterfall model? We've said that first drawback. Number two is that it's inflexible in terms of partitioning the project into distinct stages, then uh, this model is only appropriate for, requ uh, for systems whose requirements are very well understood and changes will fairly be limited. Then a uh, few businesses have such stable requirements, so it may be a big challenge. Then uh, the second model is the evolutionary development model. This is a model that we have in place or in a place whereby maybe you may not be able to use the waterfall model. Now, the evolutionary development is based on the idea of developing an initial implementation of the system, exposing it to the user, get their feedback, refine that software, and then finally have an adequate system for the customer. So here you will have several versions of the system. You develop a, so a software, you give it to the customer, they give you their feedback, incorporate the feedback they are giving you, redesign the system until you have a final product. Now there are two types of evolutionary development. We have exploratory programming or exploratory prototyping, and we have what we call throwaway prototyping. Now, exploratory programming is where the objective of the process is to work with the customer to explore the system requirements. Throwaway, on the other hand, is a, a, an approach whereby the objective of the evolutionary development process is to understand 
the customer's requirements and therefore develop a, develop a better requirement for the system. Now, this is basically uh, the main steps in the evolutionary development. You have an outline of the system or an outline description of the system where you have the specification, you develop the system, validate the system, have an initial, initial version. Redo the, again the specification development and validation, then you do the, an intermediate version. You may have several versions before the final version. Then uh, the evolutionary approach of software development is usually more effective than the waterfall model, especially where requirements are not clear. Next is, uh, it's good to note that uh, there are many, basically three problems with uh, the evolutionary kind of approach. One is that the process is not visible. You don't know how long you will be doing this back and forth developing a software product, giving it to the customer. So this, the process is not visible. It's not clear. You don't know where is the end. Number two is that systems are usually poorly structured. When you do and redo something, the structure or the outcome may not be very neat. Then the last uh, uh, challenge is that you need to have special skills that are very dynamic because you never know what the customer is asking for tomorrow. So you really need to be dynamic in your skill. Then uh, evolutionary kind of development is more appropriate for systems that are relatively small. It's also appropriate for systems that have a short lifetime. And then it is appropriate for systems that are part of a larger system. So it's good when you're using it to develop a small portion of a larger kind of system. Now the third generic software process model is a component-based software engineering, CBSE. Now, this is based on systematic reuse where systems are integrated from existing components of commercially off-the-shelf kind of systems. Now, these are systems that are already in our shelf. We are simply just modifying them. Now, the main process or stages in CBSE are you analyze the component that you are supposed to be developing, make modification into that component, then design that component with reuse, and last but not least is develop and in do the integration. Now this approach is becoming increasingly used as components have standards now, or we have standards now of each of the components. So you can simply take what you have in the shelf, modify it to meet the customer needs that they are giving you. Now, uh, component-based software engineering has the following steps here. We have the first step is you define or re uh, have your requirements clearly specified of the system you want to develop. Analyze the components that you have in your shelf. And then after that, you need to do modification. You've seen what you need against what you have. Do a modification. Know what is there already what needs to be changed in the system and then now do the designing with reuse after you factored in the component specification and the requirement specifications then afterwards you do development and then integrate the components and validate the system by testing to see that the system is actually what the customer wants and it conforms to its specification great now uh when we are doing software development or we are using these uh, software process models, we may have two approaches here. You may do the incremental delivery, whereby you deliver the system as a single delivery to the customer, or you may do the spiral development. This approach was proposed by Boehm in 1988, and he suggested that a model be used that is explicit that is explicit in recognizing risks that may, may form the basis of the generic process model. So it's good to prepare for risks. You know that software or software engineering is a project like any other. You may have risks, so you, it's good to put risks in mind. And this was defined by this gentleman we are calling Boehm in 1988. Then we have another software process model called RUP. RUP stands for Rational Unified Process. And uh, Rational Unified Process has 
three or four main steps. We have inception, elaboration, construction, and transition. Now, this is just an other added model. It's not uh, a generic model as we have listed before, but it's a good model to appreciate where software engineers can use. Inception here is whereby you establish the business case for the system. Establish the business process you want to realize. After that, do an elaboration where you develop an understanding of the process domain and the architecture of the system. Then do the actual construction, which is system design, programming, and testing. Then you transition. Transition is change here, whereby you deploy the system in its operating environment. The faces are here. You start with inception, move on to elaboration, do the actual construction, and then transition. Now, what are some of the suggestions of RUP good practice? One is that develop software iteratively in an incremental order. Then manage the requirements. Use component-based architectures whereby you're getting components that are already in your shelf, as we had said in CBSE, then visually model your software, have a visual representation of your software, then verify software quality. You would not want to release a product that is not fully, fully done or not done very well according to the quality controls that are there. So it's important to verify that your software quality is good. Then last but not least is control changes to the software. Ensure that you have control, change management uh, techniques so that you have change to avoid going back and forth into your software. That's the end of our lesson. Thank you. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.